Aloha no, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Welcome to Long Story Short. What does it mean to be an artist? For our guest, it's a lifelong journey of creative expression through dance. Peter Rockford Espiritu is founder, choreographer, and artistic director of Tao Dance Theater, a dance company that combines ballet, modern dance, hula, and Pacific Island traditions into something completely original. Our conversation gives us a glimpse into the creative process of Hawaii artist Peter Rockford Espiritu. Theater. Tao is actually my name. It's a shortened version. It's Samoan. It's my middle name. And my name is Utu Tao, but my family calls me Tao for short. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to call my, my, my company. And one day, it was, I had to give a credit. It was Melvin Lead who told me, Tao, you should just call your company Tao. Tao Dance Theater. You know, and I said, well, it's going to be Tao Dance Theater. I said, are you sure? And she says, everyone's doing one name thing now. Use Tao. It's Polynesian. It's easy. You know, and, then it, and it means more than one thing. So um, I did. I used Tao, and it stuck. And that's why you say Pacific Islander rather than Hawaiian, because you're Samoan too. Correct. My father is the Hawaiian. He's half Hawaiian from Maui. And my mother is actually from Pangatomo, from the American Samoa. I noticed you're wearing a hala lei of a color I've never seen before. It's, a, it's an orange red, but it's more red, and it's very rare to see that color these days. I think it was more common before, and uh, I'm partial to hala. A lot of people that know me know that I, I'm, I love hala. Um, the, 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 what it represents about beginning and endings, and uh, for me, a lot of my life is about beginning and ending. So I thought hala might be appropriate, and the color certainly is beautiful and very Hawaiian. Beginning and endings, you mean your productions? My productions, um, I feel like a, a lot of times we start from uh, just a little seed that's planted, and it grows into this big tree, and, and it is unveiled to the public, but eventually it has to I have to let it go and, and move on to the next thing. And, uh, and so that, that semblance of, of the Hawaiian say huli here, where things turn over, or um, that is, uh, I think, uh, kind of uh, hala represents that, that uh, what, we, what we do in the, in the business world of, of the arts. You're known for combining and mixing genres of dance, but I think I've heard you say that you're a traditionalist. How does that fit in? Well, you know, I, I think to uh, respectfully, and, I, and I'm all about that respect, it, uh, to do this, you have to be really heavily grounded down here. And uh, I, I take a lot of, uh, I do a lot to make sure that my, my, con my connection to the base is strong. And so in those ways, I still uh, study the art and the, the form and the life of hula, and I feel that I dedicate myself to that. I still take uh, dance classes. I still go to uh, ballet classes, and I, and I keep myself regimented in those forms because uh, I have to express myself in a different way. I have to be able to have um, tools at my disposal. If I don't understand the base and where the base is, then I can't abstract and, and uh, take it to another place. And uh, that's where I love, the, my love of, of the art form uh, is, even if I'm creating a new art form. Do you take flack from traditionalists who don't want you to take their form anywhere? Um, actually, a lot of, if I do, it's probably someone who doesn't know me or the, um, the, the process and the, the respect that I give that process. Um, a lot of times my answer to them is, it's your job to keep the traditions alive and keep that base solid. It's my job to identify for today and possibly tomorrow. And so 
um, I, I, I will always um, stand behind my work and always try to uh, explain where I'm going with something and why I'm going there. And uh, if they can show me that I'm causing trouble in, in the wrong sense, I will stop what I'm doing. You collaborated with the traditionalist Hawaiian Kanaka Ole hula family on what a sense was in a sense was a modern hula. How mm -hmm. did that happen? Well, uh, I, I sought them out. I wanted to do something that honored the new island. Well, it's going to be a new island maybe in 20, 50,000 years, um, which they named Lo'ihi. Um, I wanted to honor that island, and I identified with that island because it is a new entity. beginning. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's once again hala. There's mm -hmm. going to be a beginning, and eventually it's going to break through the water, and it's going to be part of the Hawaiian chain. What does that mean to us as now? Well, it should mean something to us. And I, I felt that there should be something that would honor that island. And I thought, what better people to go towards and ask to help me um, honor this island than to the, the traditionalists of Hula, uh, the Kanakaole. And uh, they thought about it. They thought about it for two years before they took that step. And uh, I'm grateful for, to them. They felt it was their kuleana because of their connection to Pele and the lava flows, and that is what is causing this island to come. So now they are chants and um, that will honor that island. When that honor that island comes, if we, as uh, human beings, survive ourselves, I hope that those uh, those dances and chants will survive um, that island to honor it when it does become an, a truly a truly an island. By that time, today's modern chants will be ancient chants. It'll be kahiko, <laughs> and there we go again, full circle. How did you translate lo'ihi in dance? You know, we actually, uh, we're always talking about, I always talk about identity, because that's what I struggle with. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Antipua and, and Nalani, what they did was identify, they actually ended, ended up calling the island uh, Kama'ehu, the reddish child. And they, we called the project, it went from being lo'ihi to Hanau Komoku, meaning an island is born. So what we had to do was start to write new chants and identify what that island and what it meant to us inside as Hawaiians, and then uh, translate that to movement. And uh, as they started developing their side, I had to identify what we were doing, what, you know, because the, the hula is very restrictive. And uh, they have to adhere to those restrictions. Me as, as a modernist, I don't necessarily have to. I can wear lights on our heads and move around, and and we could be the sludge and the and and the the you know the coral polyps. We can do those things. We can stand on top of each other and move. So it actually helped to tell a story in a brighter, wider sense of the word. And uh, that was my. That was my goal, to help tell that story. You say you struggle with identity as an issue in general. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to imagine you as a kid from Iea <laughs> who wanted to grow up and be a ballet dancer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I struggled. It's funny because I always walked that really fine line. I was a uh, three-year letterman for Iea High School for the um, soccer program there for the varsity team. I was team captain when I was a senior, but I was also a band geek. You know, I was in the marching band. Um, I studied hula. I was part of the drama department. And, and I was kind of just in everything, but everything artistic. And uh, as I got older, wanting to do ballet, a local young kind of punky kid, local from Iea, wanting to go to New York and dance. So I had to struggle with what that meant to, to me. I was fine with it, but what did that mean to my family? You know, they certainly didn't want me to go off and go move to New York and do ballet. You know, that was the furthest thing. My father is a, is a uh, you know, he's a welder, you know, by trade. And he's a local, you know, young, great man from Maui. Certainly ballet was not in his, you know, vision for he me. He didn't want to tell his friends at the <laughs> construction yard, hey, my kid's going to be a right. ballerina. Right, well, he's going to be a nutcracker. Go <laughs> yeah. check him out, you yeah. know. But uh, actually now, he probably says, that you know, my son is a ballet dancer, and he he he's an, a director and artist. You know, he he's an artist, and he he's a dancer, and he's proud of me. Well, at that time, who were your influences? Who did you look to in art to emulate and learn from? Um, Martha Graham. Um, in ballet, Brishnikov certainly was you know starting to uh, hold, hold the torch for um, male dancers. Um, I struggled with identity because what does that mean? I want to be a ballet dancer, but I still love my hula, you know. So I had to find, I had to go off and look for 
who I was and why I was. So you did go to New York and you did become a ballet dancer. <laughs> I did. I was crazy and 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 enough to and energetic enough to uh, move to New York and and start to follow that dream. And uh, I I put, got a scholarship at the School of American Ballet, which is a feeder school of New York City Ballet, that was founded by uh, George Balanchine. And uh, I pursued that dream until until I found out that well I eventually realized I wasn't going to be the the prince. I wasn't going to play the lead role. There was a chance, a big, big chance that I might, but uh, the furthest, the, the highest I felt that I could go, given my stature and all of that, uh, would be... Stature and all of that, please okay, explain. Okay, I have to, I, 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 I really think that in the ballet world, at that time, and you're talking early to mid 80s. Um, I was brown, I was short, and I wasn't blue, blonde haired and blue eyed. I wasn't gonna be the prince. And I had, I had to, once again, I had to struggle with the whole thing of this was my dream. I went to New York to become the, the obtain the highest position I could in ballet. It wasn't gonna happen. It's like the equivalent of be, you'd always be a character actor rather than the star of a movie. Exactly. When I left, I knew I was going to start my own company. And what that company was going to be, I wasn't sure. But that started the whole journey towards Tao Dance Theater, which is where I ended up trying to identify myself as an artist, as a choreographer, and as a dancer. Combining art forms, bridging traditions, and even redefining culture. These may seem like near impossible goals, but as we'll see, it's all part of the creative journey and search for identity for Peter Rockford Espiritu when our conversation continues. Get interactive with Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Log on to pbshawaii.org and connect to Long Story Short to see who's scheduled to appear in upcoming episodes. Submit questions for them and submit suggestions for future guests. Get involved and get interactive with pbshawaii.org. Respect is a word you use almost as often as you use identity. But very important to you, both of these concepts. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a um, it's the basis of what Tao Dance Theory is all about. Um, without the the core base tradition, I'm nothing. Without the traditionalists keeping their traditions alive, and and without people understanding the base. Um, I'm just, we're just a bunch of people jumping around doing weird things. And that's not my goal. My goal is to understand that there is a connection. To help you identify and understand that connection, that piece is connected to this in some way. The hala, the beauty of the, and the scent that it gives off and the traditions. I'm, I am both of these things. And as a, as a modernist, my job is to uh, help you understand that the reason why I'm here is because of the connection to these. And uh, I am asking for respect to um, my genre and where I'm going, because I'm not just doing anything. I'm, I'm trying to keep the traditions alive by identifying who I am, so. To do this, you have to understand all of the genres and yourself. And not be afraid to take those steps, because um, you, know, you put something out there, you're leaving yourself open for people to uh, you know, not agree. And I don't need you to like my work or agree. I need you to understand that this is one person's view, my view. I don't expect to be correct. I just expect you to understand that I'm expressing myself artistically, respectfully, and trying to find my own identity. Did you ever miss the mark for yourself? Oh, man. More often than not, and I, I myself sometimes don't like my own work, and I'm very honest about it. I'm learning. I'm I'm a, still a student, and I, I don't think I'll ever master any of it. But um, if uh, uh, I think that sometimes I do miss the mark, and uh, the other thing to remember is to 
uh, apologize if you do miss the mark. But uh, you put yourself out there and, uh, and uh, you do become something of a lightning rod. You do, and uh, you have to understand, I mean, um, that um, you have to do your homework and be able to explain what it is that you're trying to say. Because, you know, people might not get what you're trying to do. But you know, and, and probably related to some of the leading figures in traditional hula. I do, uh, and I continue to study. My, my, um, my first kumu hula was the late John Kaimikawa. Uh, my Awana teacher was the late Uncle George uh, Kananio Kiakua uh, Holokai. Um, I now study uh, Olapa uh, traditional with Auntie Sissy Akim and Mel, Melvin Lantaka. Um, uh, I do take ballet class on a regular basis and take modern with my original modern dance teacher, Betty Jones, who was a founding member of the Jose Limon Modern Dance Company in New York. So I keep my tradition, no base, solid, but uh, I also try to keep myself open to new things. So you're a dancer and a dance student, and um, Tao Dance Theater is a 501c3 nonprofit foundation, and you do everything, right? You you choreograph, you do the business side, you the promotional side mm -hmm. must be intense. Uh -huh. You market, you fundraise. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you do all of that? You know, it's a it's a matter of survival. I mean, I do wear many hats, uh, including grant writing, um, budget projections, final reports, keep making sure our 501c3 is healthy fundraising and, and the vision of that, as well as Kokua groups that I think are, are important to support. Um, it's all part of the Kuleana, and I, I know you understand that because that's part of who you are, and that's important to you. All right, let's talk about transitions within your productions. You tell stories, mm -hmm. and you go from one genre to another, but those transitions have to make sense. How do you make them flow? For instance, uh, Nalpaka, which was the last full evening length work we did. Um, the whole idea is to stay open to not trying to just tell a story in one genre, but for instance, uh, uh, when the two lovers meet, um, there is tension, um, they are just meeting, they're young, and, and, uh, and what does that whole scene mean to me? It means that there is uh, entanglement. And what is the genre that I chose? Tango but it's also, there's a girl on point. In the Ava section in um, Naupaka, it's about the drink of Ava, but what is the cup that is used? It's a coconut. So we use the more of a traditional well, Samoan coconut style dancing, and, and we use the slap dancing or, or Hawaiian. They use the pa'iu mauma to uh, start it. It's a very physical kind of male thing, and I use those genres and to tell that story. So. Um, my whole uh, job as an artistic director or as a storyteller through dance and movement is to identify what is the most appropriate movement tool to tell that story. We're not a halal, so we're not uh, um, left to uh, confines of one genre. Uh, I use all of the styles possible to tell a story as long as it helps tell the story, not detract from the telling of it. Do you ever use traditional Hawaiian music for your modern uh, productions? I do. Um, now again, you're talking about tradition. And uh, if it's a, for instance, if, it's a, if you're talking about music and tradition, if it's a mele or an ole that is uh, existing, um, I tend not to touch them. If I do touch them, they will pre be presented in the form that is most um, appropriate. If it's going to be, for instance, a Kalakawa chant, it's going to be done the way it's supposed to be, an Olapa style. No changes, no nothing. Um, so we rarely go there. We, um, we tend to want to create new uh, ole or mele, and then, create, then we can go on from there. Peter Rockford Espiritu has an amazing ability to take audiences to places they've never been. A Tao Dance Theater production can challenge the very meaning of dance and even culture. As our conversation continues, he talks about finding kindred spirits on his quest for creative expression and excellence. PBSHawaii.org is your online resource for program schedules and information on PBS shows and local productions. Log on and connect to Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox to download transcripts from this and all episodes. Get online and get interactive at PBSHawaii.org.
We're back on Long Story Short with the founder of the Tao Dance Theatre, and that is Peter Rockford Espiritu. Welcome back. Thank you. You're so different. You, you meld so many ways and are aware of so many genres, and you say you like to keep the Tao Dance Theatre small uh, because you need to work with people who truly understand. How many people do you find who, who are kindred souls? On average, the dancers that I use are about 13 to 15 strong for a large production. Um, it usually bumps up to double that. But uh, kindred souls, I think uh, uh, collectively the people that I work with become one for me. But they don't have to have the same vision you do. You just have to tell them of your vision right now, right? Yeah, and they don't necessarily have to agree with me. They have to be strong enough to call me on things and say, you know, I don't understand where you're going with this. Or, and uh, yeah, they have to understand what I'm all about, but they also have to be strong within what they do. And now you're taking your efforts out to the schools. You're, you're, you're working with kids. We are. We've always been in the school system, and we've always done um, youth and outreach. And all, every production we've done has always had an uh, educational element. We are actually now in the process of starting a youth group. It's called Tao Y2, like Y squared. Mm -hmm. And it's because uh, after 10 years of being a, a company, I felt that it was time to take a step towards uh, really investing in our future. The idea is that this youth group will uh, not only represent us as youth, but down the line, uh, hopefully, they will be the feeder uh, company to, uh, to the Tao Dance Theater, which is the, the adult company. Are they more open than others say to, op to mixing genres, combining? You know, the, what we're doing now is helping them identify the different genres, what the genres are that make Tao Dance Theater, which is ballet, modern, uh, hula, and, and maybe a little jazz hip hop, and then understanding how those genres have helped evolve Tao into what it is now. How are most dancers that you work with at um, moving from one genre to another? I mean, you'd think most people would be best at one and they'd have a second and they'd have a distant third. Sure. How easy is that for it's them? It's not easy at all. Uh, a lot of my dancers uh, have one form that they are comfortable with. I push them to be comfortable with two or three. Uh, truthfully, many of the dancers who naturally fall into Tao Dance Theater um, have had hula background. Um, at, but chose Western form. And so uh, I think a, a lot of them, uh, or they've had ballet and then have had others. I don't think I have too many that are just, you know, specialty. You know, that's very rare when I'm, I'm using a dancer that way. Do you think what you're doing will always be an alternative form of the arts, or can you see yourself going mainstream with this? Uh, you know, I, I think um, we once again walk that fine line of mainstream. I mean, we do convention work, and we do that kind of um, corporate business kind of thing where it, it's, uh, to me, that's not reality. I mean, and, and I have no problem with that side because I'm well, how large. did you do that? Well, you know, the, uh, I'm very strong with my cultural ties, and I understand the corporate side, um, and I understand the connection to it. So, for instance, we ended up using uh, elements, and uh, for instance, water. Now, culturally, sound-wise, I first thing that came into my mind was ohe, the the uh, nose flute. So, using the nose flute and going into an oli, going into a hula, and then that nose flute transcends into a jazz flute and now you have a connection and the jazz flute can go into the corporate uh, phonetic movement of the you know the everyday kind of thing and, and uh, my I kept using those kinds of themes using fire using earth and mm -hmm. and and trying to help translate the Hawaiian bass into a corporate theme and not everything has to be literal. It doesn't have to be literal. They don't even have to understand it. And that's another thing about my productions. Maybe uh, I try to layer things. You can choose to enjoy just the beauty of the movement and the sound and the, and the music. Or you can choose to go deeper because there's always going to be layers. And you can actually dig deeper to try to find the cultural connections to what I'm trying to say. And you were a person of many layers. You know, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that Hala, with its uh, beginnings and endings mm -hmm. is is what you think of because you seem to me at the core to be a person of transition and and bridging uh -huh, but for that transition to happen there has to be an ending so it's not necessarily an ending but uh it has to there has to be a finite 
thing that happens. I'm good at connecting, and I'm always trying to make it seamless. But at the same time, maybe um, that's part of what I do, is to make it seem like there is no ending. Creating seamless transitions that make it seem like there's no end. What a beautiful concept. Mahalo to Peter Rockford Espiritu for sharing his story. And as always, we need to keep this long story short. I'm Leslie Wilcox with PBS Hawaii. Ahoi ho kako. I go once a year to the uh, Hilo Casting Club. Uh, I try to go maybe three or four times a year. I can let go of all the stresses of, of and it is stressful, and all the, all the things that are my responsibility and kuleana, and I can actually just look at the elements. Places like Ka'u, or Kalawalo, or you know, Hamakua side, or um, uh, Kalapana area. Um, these are all Hawaii Island areas because that's where I choose to go and stomp and, and, and travel, but um, those are places where my electronics won't work. I can bring my computer, but it won't be able to connect. My cell phone might not work. And, uh, and that's that, a good thing, That's right? a great <laughs> thing. I look forward to it.